John, it's really great to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, Rafe. I've been really uh, excited to follow your work and uh, deeply appreciative of seeing you make use of some of my work. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to thank you for that uh, in person. I'm so really, really happy to be here. Yeah. So for those of you watching, this is going to be more of a, a conversation, less of a strict interview, where I'm going to be sharing some of my ideas with John and getting his feedback on them. Um, so what we've been working on uh, is a kind of a map of, mm. uh, of what Evolve the Play is all about. And, right. Yeah. You know, we've talked about this idea of the ecology of practices before. Very much. Yeah. You know, we've been trying to break down, like, what, what is it that we're doing? Where, what are all these pieces? And, you know, we've come up with essentially there's a, a set of body practices, like there's the practices within the body and how the body relates to things. So we've got right, a right. practice that's kind of like a meditation that's internal, that's about the body. Right. But, you know, a body integrity practice. Like how do I make sure this thing that I'm in or this thing that is me um, is sustained and, and functions and has as good a relationship between all its component pieces as possible? Right. Um, yep. then, then how do I, uh, then, then there's the body to environment practice. Mm -hmm. right? How do I, uh, how do I make more sophisticated, more differentiated, more competent my relationship to the environment around me, the static mm -hmm. environment around me. Mm -hmm. And then there's a body to object practice, right? Where do, you know, the, the environment is the things that, that we move ourselves on and the objects are the things that we can move, right? That's the basic. Right, right. Right, right, right. Yeah. You move things, that becomes a really interesting place where there's lots of stuff to practice. And then there's ourselves and other bodies, body to bodies. Right. right. So that's the center of our of our physical practices. And what we do um, is really at that point, right? Like we're the mm -hmm. the body people. Like um, you know, I've been enjoying listening to your to your interview to to your your podcast series or your your lecture series. I've been enjoying interesting your talks with Guy Sangstock and Jordan Hall and all these guys. But the one thing that I'm always asking is where is the body in this story? Sure, sure. Well, I do, I do, I do constantly say that body practices have to be in the ecology of practices. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I often point to, to your work, in fact, as exemplifying um, a community of practice that's creating an ecology of practices. Uh, so yeah, very much. Um, I agree with that. And, and I, you know, and at some point we might talk about, some of the some of the phenomena that uh, uh, earmark that like when you for example a, a body uh, environment relationship uh, if you're coupled very well to the environment you're probably going to get into the flow state and what does that look like and and things like that so but yes I I very much agree uh, with what you've said and then there's another way in which my work converges with it because as you know uh, I advocate for four E cognitive science and for understanding cognition as you know embodied embedded you know, extended, um, et cetera. Um, and so um, while I don't often talk about it as concretely as you do, I think what you're doing is very convergent. The, the work I'm doing with Guy and Jordan is, and you know, it, it, we, we do talk about uh, the embodied aspects for the reasons I've just articulated. But right now we're really focused on trying to get, um, trying to get a, a psychotechnology for dialogue that's analogous to what the ancient practice of dialectic was so that we can uh, learn how to activate collective intelligence within, distrib within distributed cognition and in a way that's analogous to individual cognition. The way individual intelligence can be bootstrapped into rationality and into wisdom, I'm trying to figure out, can we, cre can we create a psychotechnology dialectic that activates dialogue within collective intelligence so it can be bootstrapped into collective rationality and collective wisdom. So that's why that's that's what that's why that's foregrounded right now because um, I think that that is to use Jordan's term that's a meta psychotechnology that all all the groups like your group will need that too because part of what like I see you doing right is you're also getting into dialogue and we're doing it right now and so how can we optimize that dialogue so the dissemination and the cultivation uh, for you of the embodied ecology of practices can be can, can happen much more fluently, much more effectively, in a much more flowing manner. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, I uh, so movement is at the center of what we do, and we want to like be really clear about that. But what we've recognized is that our orientation around movement is how it transforms people. Right. Right. Excellent. 
If we notice that movement does this thing to people, then we can look at these, these other streams, these other ecologies, these other practices, and how they can assist in that. We want That's to be excellent focused on where where our expertise is, you know, and and yeah. kind of like know know what our center is. It's not everyone's center. It's not the center that ne necessarily is the center, but it's our center. But yeah. with the movement, then there's a mindfulness piece, yes, and a community piece. And this is what yeah. I believe yeah. that you were you were challenging me on this the last time we were calling you. So where is yes, the, yeah, where is yeah. So I've, I've written that in now. Um, <laughs> and then there's the nature piece, right? A relationship yes. to nature. Yep. Um, so, you know, I've taken the distinction that I learned from you of meditation and contemplation. And I've actually been using, um, so what we've been doing is a combination of a focus practice that I learned from my friend Simon Thacker, our Thacker, sorry. Um, you know, I do, you know, there's obviously just the breath, but I like to focus on a single point and try to collapse yeah. my on that point right right to to learn to control attention i find that practice is somewhat disembodying though right? yes yep, yep. So i like to couple that with a body scan meditation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. and then i will transition from that once i have uh i feel like i've attuned and improved my ability to uh to control attention then i do a meta meditation excellent actually taught to me by our mutual friend mark walsh Ah, excellent. Um, and that's that's actually really profound effects. It's quite interesting. Like yeah, I, that's that's the core of prajna. Like you, learning how to go deep in and then deep out, and then learning how to flow between them. That's why the movement practices also tie in, right? Because the movement practices give your brain that interactive schema of how to move in and out. So I see. Like when I'm doing Tai Chi Chuan, you're literally doing the in and out movement, uh, but that is overlapping with the in and out of attention that you're doing in the prajna practices. So the movement mindfulness and the sit-in mindfulness can talk deeply to each other. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting because the, you know, I always like to at least return to like my base frame, right? It's like if I'm going to teach martial arts, I need to at least know that the things that I'm teaching are helping people fight, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like everything else that I claim has to sort of not ignore this most basic principle, right? right. So when I think about meditation, I also recognize that uh, it actually, it, the meditation trains my ability to focus on the thing that I need to focus in the moment when I'm actually moving. And that without that, I'm, it, or that, that's one of the biggest dangers that we face is our attention being on the wrong thing. Like most yes. of all the series of parkour movements, it's because your attention has shifted too early, right? right. So you're, you're looking ahead in the sequence or it's just shifted completely out of the frame, right? Yeah. You're, you're moving and suddenly you have a thought about your girlfriend and you fall down. Right, right. Um, and so that ability to attune and, and train the attention um, is actually incredibly critical to successfully completing the movements and of course that all it connects in in flow state and then i guess it it goes the other way too right as i learned in the parkour informed by the mindfulness uh to more appropriately distribute my attention that should then ramify out into my life in general right it, that's the idea so so like why do parkour in addition to meditation might be the opposite question right yeah yeah one question is why do why would a parkour athlete want to do meditation? Uh, but a second question would be like, why would a meditator want to do parkour? And, Those are both good questions. Yeah, and uh, and the reason that I might recommend that, uh, parkour to a meditator is kind of what you just mentioned, which is this idea that um, essentially we're making physical the processes that people are trying to apply in their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is where like I really love the embodied and um, embodied and embedded. Right. Yes. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like you can train the mind, but if it isn't in relationship to the body, it's missing this tremendous aspect. Because you know, this is one of the things I love about your work. You make so clear that how we think is extraordinarily conditioned on the fact that we have bodies, right? Or how we much, are bodies. We are bodies. Yeah. How much of our how much of our thinking is is framed in analogies of the body to understand, yes. to have yeah. a group on something. Yeah. Yes, very much. Um, and so I think it's very easy in our culture to lose sight of this, but 
when we make a more erudite body. Oh, I like that. That's a nice turn of phrase. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I just, I was actually, um, I was, I was reading uh, up, uh, I was trying to find this quote that I thought I had heard from like Epictetus about um, wrestling being the foundation of physical culture. And I couldn't find it. Maybe it's a misattribution. Um, mm -hmm. But I started reading about how Plato was a wrestler. And yes. Yeah. From wrestling. Which yeah, was yeah. Then, yeah, I know very much. And so, uh, yeah, gymnastic and athletic metaphors are pervasive uh, through Plato. Wrestling with philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I think is quite interesting. And it, it's interesting because you don't have that uh, association now. One does not expect uh, a philosopher to be a physical practitioner. No, and, th and that's unfortunate. I, I mean, I think that's more the case, if you'll allow me these adjectives, in Western philosophy uh, than what you might find in, 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 in Asiatic philosophy. Yeah. So, and then the contemplation is also really interesting because... Um, I think that when you start having that orientation towards towards wanting to bring good into the world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it helps regulate emotion and regulation of emotion is actually super key to uh, athletic performance as well. It's something that I think is, is massively under understood is how much people's frustration, fear, sadness, anger, et cetera, is actually the thing that has to be addressed in order for them to make progress. Yeah, I think that's very well said. I think it's very well said. I, 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 I think that, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> from what I know uh, uh, within like uh, Tai Chi Chuan, and, but also what I've read about in gymnastics in uh, ancient Greece, I mean, one of the functions of the athletic uh, endeavors was to afford people exactly that kind of training. Uh, <laughs> learning, uh, you know, very, very much in the power of an exigent moment to out exercise self-regulation of emotion, I think is one of the key things. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that, so yeah, so we have that, that interaction again, where, where the, the, the mindfulness gives us something as an athletic tool, but then the athletic pr practice gives us a window into and a place to put characteristics. This is exactly what I, this is one of the features on it, because I'm trying to do this meta thing right now where I'm trying to get at, you know, what are we looking for in ecology of practice? And one of the one of the things I've talked about is the checks and balances, but also this other thing you're talking about, the way they they mutually in, interpenetrate and mutually afford each other, right? That's also uh, a really important thing that you want to be looking for, I would argue, in an ecology of practices. Because if, if they don't do this, if they don't, uh, sort of impregnate each other with transformation, then you're not going to have a very you're not going to have a very dynamic self-organizing system. Yeah. The, so what what comes up in my head then is this this general question that I have about the the power of emergence and of dynamical systems as a as a as a reframing from an excessive reductionism. So I, I yeah. want to get into that with you. I think that'd be a really deep uh, line of, of of inquiry. But I want to just go through this 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 little oh, please. model. Please, am, am I am I giving the kind of feedback that you'd like right now? I'm yeah. not jumping in too much. I'm just trying to comment along the way. No, no, please, please do, please do. I am. Um, I'm. This is a little new because I'm. I'm used to when I interview people having my interviewer persona in on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like balance that between like how would I talk to John if it was just me and John talking? Well, see, Rafe, this is also helping me because this is exemplifying this process of dialogue and trying to get an emergence like of the logos in the dialogue so that it, it starts to take a shape of its own and leads us into places uh, that are insightful and transformative for us. Sweet. So what I'm going to actually do is I just, I, I was, I managed to, uh, to, I didn't know if I had done this, but I, I saved this, this thing that I'm looking at and I can share it with you. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, to share this and now you can see it, right? Yes. Yes, I can. So this is what we do, right? Mindfulness, community, nature, and yes, um, and then there's some. <laughs> this will get really, really interesting here. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So we talked about meditation, contemplation, then obviously dialogue. We're just in this in this conversation about dialogue, but um, right. so what we've noticed that what people uh, comment on 
about our workshops more than anything else is the sense of community. Yes. Yeah. Important to them. Yeah. And then you 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 asked me this question last time we talked to like well, what is the community practice? Right. Right. And Very much. I hadn't done that explicitly, but it is implicitly or was becoming more explicitly part of what we were doing. So one of the things um, is actually a dialoguing practice. And this has been um, quite interesting as a development. Uh, so traditionally at my workshops, I would tell a lot of sort I would do a lot of kind of lecture about the, mm -hmm. the theory and the, and the practice, right? So people could put it in, in context and gain the insight out of the physical practice. Sure. Uh, now, I went to train with Mark Walsh in June, and he had this practice of just having people after a drill have one minute to share their insights. And then he'd ask a few leading questions to help people do that. Right, right, right. Uh, so we adopted this when we, uh, when we, um, cool, when we taught this summer. And it was really interesting how the yeah. insights that I used to feel like I had to share with people were self. I, they were yep. self generated by the group and we got everyone talking. So we drove a real interest in dialogue. The other aspect of these community things is we found that storytelling has this enormous power. Mm -hmm. um, as a teacher, as I've sorted stories of myself, and then once I encountered Jordan Peterson's work, actually telling old mythological stories and connecting yep. work. Yep. I'm very powerful. And then I've got retreat down here itself because, like, I don't know how to describe the whole container of these things, but when you go away with people and you make food and you and you do the dishes together and you go have saunas, whatever it is, all yeah, of that, yeah. you know, you're getting that. yeah, you're synchronizing up in powerful ways. Yeah, I get that. That's very good. And then the body to body practices, of course, fit as a community development tool as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then this one uh, is something that new and kind of breaking things down. But I I wrote down your your four ways of knowing, right? Propositional. Mm -hmm. all, perspectival and participatory. And I was just looking through how I've helped people understand nature in um, in the workshops that we did. And then also how my, uh, my, my colleague, Kyle Cox. So Kyle is one of our teachers. Um, so he's been one of my students for many years now, but he is also a trained teacher under the Wilderness Awareness School method uh, from the Inake Wilderness Awareness School. So he teaches. So I noticed that what I do a lot is what I would call nature knowledge. So it's propositional, right. so propositional knowledge about here's what to look for so that a tree branch doesn't break. Here's, you know, what the local ecology is like. Here's all this stuff. Right. Uh, and then what Kyle brings is things like sit spotting, which is awareness training, like meditation ah, in, yeah. in orientation toward nature. How do I recognize what is the, like the furthest sound of a bird that I can hear? Right. What are the birds saying? And, you know, what is what type of water sounds are happening? All those things, learning to move, zoom that awareness in and out. But oh, excellent. Way that what's, that, what's that called again, Rafe? I can't quite read it. What's it called? It's sit something? Oh, sit spotting. Sit spotting. Ah, oh, cool. Oh, and, and there's a, a play on the word spotting. I get that. Oh, that's very good. I like that. That's very clever. Oh, sorry, I mean that in a complimentary fashion. <laughs> it's not mine. Um, I, I think it may come from a, a teacher named John Young, or it may precede him. Yeah. I learned this from from my friend Simon Tapper, who I mentioned before, and Kyle. And right. then you can do the same type of walking meditation practice where you're working. Yeah, with yep. yeah I've taught people walking hunting, meditation. Hunting, gathering, right? Right. These, also connecting to these proud these things and and uh, and indeed like fire making and uh, primitive stuff. So that's where where we we bring the nature in specifically. Wow, that's very good. I like that. That's very interesting. So here's I, I wanted to tell you this interesting story about like the power of the let's call it the participatory perspectival, um, which is also something I'm just starting to understand. But um, so I asked Kyle to teach bird languages. And I expect him to walk through the woods with the students and describe to them what type of songs birds sing and you know, help them recognize this. And he sets up this game where everyone pretends to be a bird in the forest. Oh, very shamanic. That's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm very tired because it's kind of like I teach for three days and then it's Kyle's day to lead the wilderness awareness. And so I'll just like go take a nap sometimes. So I'm like, ah, I'm not really into running around and pretending to be a bird. But there's birds and there's weasels and there's hawks and stuff and there's this whole structure of the game. So then I go and I, I sleep and I, I come back and I ask people like, okay, 
you know, how was it? They're like, oh, it was one of the most amazing things now. And like, people are just talking about it and their awareness of the birds and what's happening is so massively expanded. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. That is, yeah. So the generate to recognize process, which is really cool, you know, become the thing, generate it, and then you are much more capable of recognizing. That's very, that's very cool, this perspectival and participatory knowing. It's so shamanic too, right? Yeah, eh? it is. Yeah, 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 that's really, that's really cool. You're yeah. doing really interesting stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And not just me. I mean, Kyle, that's Kyle's stuff. And he... you, you're, you, you all, I meant you collectively, your you're group. Um, and, and by the way, um, I, I want to acknowledge the way you uh, share credit. I think that's excellent. Awesome. Thank you. That's one thing I really admire about you as well. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. So then this is what we do. And, you know, we're trying to get people these ways of knowing. And then essentially all of this is oriented towards creating meaning in people's life. And, yep. and I, I looked at it and this is an interesting thing that I've, I've been wanting to discuss with you. I, I just came across, I came across this actually in a conversation with another of our friends, Aaron, who's one of my uh, apprentices with uh, Evolve with Play, but he made the distinction between being and becoming. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about the having mode and the being mode. And it feels like there's some distinction here between being and becoming as well. Well, I, I, I actually say that I think the being mode should be better understood as the becoming mode. Um, it's the mode in which you're trying, you, you, these are the needs that are met by developing, by going through a process of self-transformation. And it's where um, aspiration and appreciation are playing uh, much more important roles than uh, you know, uh, control and manipulation. Um, so yeah, uh, I, 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 I think why uh, uh, Fromm and others wanted to use the being mode is because of the way in which, and this overlaps with Heidegger, who had an influence on, on Fromm, of course, um, the idea that we recover our sense of being. And if we can bring, if we can bring back the being as, you know, as the, the gerund, the active, not being as a static thing, but being, I don't want to say processes because it's deeper than a process, but you, you understand what I'm trying to convey as something much more dynamic. And so when we're in these developmental modes, we have to, we have to, we have to learn how to disclose aspects of our being so that the, 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 the world can dispose more deeply disclose aspects of its being. Um, so the being and the becoming are very deeply intertwined in that way. I hope that made some sense. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to rephrase it in, in like, I think I can use your language and tell me if this makes sense. So okay. um, it's as if the way that we think about being, like ontology, has become purely a propositional yes. problem. And what you're saying is that to like truly engage in philosophia, we have yep. to recover the participatory and perspectival being so that we are engaged in it, not just observing it. Exactly. It. That was, that, that was very well put. I completely agree with what you just said. Um, and I think, I think that's, that, that's exactly, um, exactly right. Yes. So this being and becoming distinction that we make, there's an observation in why there's a distinction. Um, mm -hmm. So the first thing is, when you're training, there's the there's the experience of the training and how it is, right? So mm -hmm. I am in a state, right? And then there's how it transforms me over time. Yes. Now, if I become hyper-focused on being in the state that I am in now, then I, I don't see. afford myself transformation effectively in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I hyper-focus on the transformation, then I never get to enjoy what I'm trying to become. Right. And so that's, that's, that's where I talk about the symbolic aspect of this, the relationship between your current self and the divine double, uh, yeah. to, to use more traditional language. Yeah, you have to have that, you have to have that symbolic relationship between the two selves, if you'll allow me that language. Yeah, I, was, uh, I haven't quite finished the latest one. I'm like 40 minutes into it, I think. But you were talking about this, you know, about literally like basically being and becoming the idea of the divine double. Exactly. Um, most recently listening to. So what it, what it feels like to me is pe people, I think people need an archetypal aim, right? This is uh, sort of what you're, you're articulating. I, I, yeah, I think, well, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I would just hesitating because I think it's a genus species thing. I think the, the Jungian notion of the archetypes is one species of ways in which people have crafted uh, symbolism around the divine double. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, the thing is, your current self causes uh, the future self, but your future self has normative authority over your current self. And sort of getting those, getting the sort of the appropriate respect for each side of that is, 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 is the virtue that we're trying to cultivate in people when we're trying to teach them proper aspiration. Yeah. So I'll, I'll share a little story. You know, this will be familiar to a lot of the viewers, but it will help ground the conversation. Um, so I came into parkour and um, I, I found something in parkour that was very meaningful to me. And there was this idea of a philosophy of parkour that I, uh, that, that I seized on, but I couldn't quite fully grasp. It didn't quite cohere completely. And so I think that what I did was I ended up essentially reframing parkour in the sport frame. Right. In this frame that, you know, we were talking about maybe descends from the national uh, nationalist and romantic you know, period of, of the 19th century. Um, yeah. Right. And that frame, you know, it's very, you know, well, perhaps not so romantic. It's very it's very much like goals. Right. We're going here. Yeah. And uh, and so it became all about smart goals, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, time sensitive. Right. And, and so I set up all these goals. And then there was this conflict because the thing that I want, that was, I was truly motivated to be, wasn't the thing that I had set out to be. Right, right, right. All of my goals were best served by like training in the gym so I could go compete in other people's gyms. But what I was deeply motivated by was going to play in the woods. Right. And so I followed my motivation out into the woods. I went deep into play as my kind of primary thing and it was really transformational um i made massive progress but at a certain point it became um it it became stagnant and it and i also started getting injured and i started feeling like i needed this sense of where i was going again and that's actually uh basically when i encountered jordan peterson's work or it was i actually had started to articulate very similar ideas i remember i wrote this essay called uh the self-worth esteeming you can check out the video on my youtube cha- page um which was all about the idea that 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 self-esteem um is kind of the wrong thing to aim at we have to aim at creating a self that we would yeah yeah yep. that's the aspirational self of socrates rather than the true self that you're born with from in romantic uh, in standard models of romanticism exactly very much so 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 we started saying okay we need we need to be aimed at something. And then it was like, well, winning at sport or having a specific skill is it's actually too narrow of a name. It doesn't really, it doesn't really encompass what the person yeah. become. It has to be about how those things transform you. And then what are they transforming you into? Um, uh, and um, well, that's, that's what this is. <laughs> this, this thing is about. So, uh, so, so yeah, so I became very interested in the idea of the hero's journey and, and that you know, confrontational mm-hmm. chaos and how that 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 aim gives us meaning. So uh, so uh, so I don't want them to have to look at this forever. So I need to go through this a little bit quicker. Um, okay, sorry. No, 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 it's great and it's been wonderful. So uh, so okay, so we have uh, the being mode, right? Or what's more being oriented here is immediately when you engage in these practices it affords something it affords a deep connection to things that are meaningful to us yeah yeah. You know, play is intrinsically meaningful and motivating right movement mm-hmm. has a meaning being in nature is meaningful being with a tribe of like-minded people engaging in something all of that um, is powerful in the moment mm-hmm. um, but then it changes you because it gives you awareness of self right yes and way we learn our own personality, right? We become, mm-hmm. come to recognize what deeply motivates us. We improve our embodiment, right? And we develop a positive relationship with our body, which is something so many people are missing in our culture, right? We view yeah. our bodies through the lens of something else, right? It's external. Yeah. Yep. And that's, I think, very deeply, um, can be very deeply alienating. If your body matters mostly to you because of how other people see it, you're essentially alienated from the most from you know the most fundamental aspect of yourself yes yes so so this is where being is becoming becoming and then over time we have this idea that we are transforming our character right so we could say that our character is transforming we can call this self-transcendence or we can call this the development of the heroic self 
Right. So right. Through these practices, we are trying to afford ourselves these connections and this transformation. Um, That's great. I agree with that. Um, so we talk about something also analogous to that, the work I did with Leo about internalizing the sage and how there was a lot of these um, wisdom traditions like Stoicism, where you're trying yeah. to internalize Socrates. Um, yeah. uh, and so the Socrates serves as a um, internalized symbol of the uh, of the future self of the sacred second self or the divine double uh, but because socrates also has a semi-independent existence socrates can challenge you and and and, and motivate you it's not just a, an egocentric mirror sort of narcissistically reflecting back to yourself uh, kind of thing and socrates had his daemon right so he also yes he also has. yes very much so i'm going to uh put this back up then um because that, that was a perfect segue into what we're talking about next, which is, so the reason that I actually reached out to you to specifically talk right now was that um, I was I was working with folks on our online course and they were asking me questions like, why can't I do X skill? And I didn't have any video of them doing the skill. So I started saying, well, you know, it's like a lack of skill. It's a lack of physical ability or it's a emotional, psycho-emotional issue, right? And then I noticed that that, had mapped this idea of what are the archetypal attributes or the archetypal representations of the heroic character that we're trying to develop. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had, you know, at, at Return to the Source the last few years, we have told these um, heroic narratives, right? We've told these stories and we've mapped the, the idea of the movement practice towards like, it's like the confrontation with the dragon in the heroic literature. And that sure. was cool. But then um, people were like, well, what, what, what is it in more depth? What is it that that gives you that capacity to confront the heroic um, figure. And so we started looking at what are the different archetypes of, of the hero? So I started seeing that there was this combination here because we, we talked about four heroic archetypes at the autumn retreat that, that, I, that I had kind of studied and that gave me inspiration for where we were going. And then I saw that this was kind of aligned. Um, and the reason I, 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 I reached out to you though was because it didn't align perfectly. And I was trying to figure out how it aligned. Um, right, right. So I, but, but what we ended up doing is, so we started saying, if we think of Horus as a, as an archetype of vision, where does vision sit in our struggle? Right. It's like, well, before, if we think of, if we think of a movement practice as a, as a way of, of embodying and cultivating the capacity of the self in general to address a problem, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, First, mm -hmm. The first problem that you have with a problem is, can you see that it's there? Yeah, I mean that's that's sort of more like at the level of like relevance realization. And Horace is often represented as a capacity for attention, uh, of, of many other things as well, of course. Uh, and Horace is of course capable of flight, uh, which in the overview, but also zooming in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's many figures that uh, have that role, uh, yeah. but but I, I yeah the 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 capacity with the the to to as you said to, to develop that um, honing a relevance realization so you have insight so you see into the situation well and powerfully yeah I think that's crucial yeah so um in in the parkour community we have this problem of vision right and i think it's a thing that 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 is a is, is a is a problem many people are facing but we've we've recognized it right in a certain way which is when you decide that you want to practice parkour you start looking around you and you can't find necessarily things that look like what you saw in the video right mm -hmm. so so over time, you cultivate this ability to see how the spaces around you afford you movement potentials. So oh, someone, I see. That's very interesting. So you're doing this sort of perspectival transformation where cool. you're, ah, that's really interesting. So you're trying to train yourself to pick up on affordances that you originally can't pick up on. That's what you're basically saying. And And what's interesting about this too is that like, uh, I found urban parkour vision developed very quickly, even though I'd grown mm -hmm. up in the woods. The the environment is relatively not complex, right? You can see. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's highly predictable. It's highly predictable. Um, moving into nature is actually, to this day, even after you know ten years of being focused on nature, eight years, whatever it is, 
um, it's harder for me to see what is afforded by a new tree or a new set of rocks than right. it is a set of uh, concrete obstacles. I have to go and physically embed myself in that environment in order to create the vision, mm -hmm. to reimagine the space. Right. That's really cool. And so, so yeah, so we, in uh, there's this, um, are you familiar with the UDA loop? No. No. You, you've mentioned to me, yeah. to, it to me before. Yeah, okay. So um, I'll, I'll go over that again. I, I think it's it's interesting to me because I just see these these common patterns showing up in all these different places. I'm really interested in how they all come together. Sure. But the uh, Udall Loop is uh, the insight of a military strategist, John Boyd. Um, he, was, he was in the Air Force. And he basically recognized that like every combative situation, in every combative situation, you face the problem of incomplete information. And this is true. Always everywhere and in life. And he, he even broke this down to basically Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and, um, um, oh, and what was the other one? Oh, the, the I think it's the second law of entropy, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, based on these, we, we, we will always have incomplete information, right? As soon as the information gets to you, it's already degraded, or it's models yes, yes. already degraded, uh, yeah. you know, and you can't see everything from within whatever frame you adopt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, but the big thing was that in order to s continuously solve problems, first you have to be able to observe accurately what the problem is, vision. Okay. Second, you have to be able to orient effectively to it, problem formulation. Then you have to, be able to make clear decisions and act. So, right. Right. observe, orient, decide, act. Interestingly, within the parkour community, we evolved essentially a similar sequence, which we call feeling the call of the jump. So. Mm -hmm. you observe that a jump is possible. You then assess the jump, and then either before or after assessment, depending on the jump, you begin to feel fear. Mm. And then you have a process that allows you to overcome fear, which is generally um, visualization, breathing, shaking, some sort of ritualized behavior that allows you to shift out of that fear state, and right, then right, right. you act. And right. so essentially, you could say, well, the first thing is, is observation, right? Um, and then essentially all the rest is like how you overcome the problem and get to decision. Right, right. So I find that really interesting. And then like there's almost a problem before that, which is how to see the call of the jumps that can call to you. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say. Yeah. And so this is, this is where, where the archetype of vision is. Right. And then uh, yes, yeah. the next would be like, understanding the problem right like i can see that this jump can be this calls to me but how would it be done right right then right. there's the skillfulness to over to actually do it and then it's yes. like it doesn't matter how perfect a jump you have if the jump is just way too large your legs can't make it you just don't have it right and the last thing is you're you know you can see it you understand what needs to be done you have the skill to know how to do it you have the physical capacity to do it Right. Do you, can you psychoemotionally regulate yourself to be able to do right. it? Right, 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 right. And so, um, interestingly, we had talked about four heroic archetypes at um, at the retreat as Horus of, is vision, um, Socrates was logos, and then Luke, right. Celtic hero, Celtic god, um, was the embodiment of skillfulness, right? Right, um, right. In, in, in Irish mythology, in, what's, in the book of the invasions, uh, Luke is, uh, is is sort of a young hero up and coming. He goes to Tara, which is the capital of the, of the right. Tuatana, and he asks for entrance. And they ask him, well, in order to come in here, you have to be really good at something. And so he starts listing off his skills, and he lists off all of the skills that were like pertinent in early medieval Ireland. And they keep telling him, oh, we've got a, we've got a carpenter, we've got a smith, we've got a soldier, yeah. we've got a soothsayer, we've got a poet, we've got a harp player, we've got a chess player, whatever. And, um, and at the end of it, he says, do you have anyone who can, uh, can do all of these? And like, oh, no, you can come in. And then right. he right. wins him to lead the battle, and then he confronts what turns out to be his own grandfather and destroys him. And that's Luke. So, so Luke is our, our idea of skillfulness. And then we talked about uh, Christ as a figure of agape. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so initially I was like, does Christ map to this emotional regulation piece, right? And it didn't feel quite right. 
Well, I have I have something to say about that if you want to hear it now. Or, or um, can I finish what I'm saying? I really want sure, to. Sure, sure, sure. But, okay. uh, but what, what, what occurred to me is actually if you take this set of heroic capacities, you can have all of them and you can be evil. Mm -hmm. If you're oriented to do the wrong things, then being able to see to see a problem, understand the problem, effectively solve the problem, have the strength to do it, and have the emotional regulation to do it can be applied to the most horrific, horrific things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then the idea was that, you know, essentially what we came up with was, you know, Socrates is actually kind of a, a combination figure for us. He's the emotional regulation and the understanding. Horus is vision. Luke is coordination and skill. You could use Hercules or Thor as representations of strength. And obviously, you know, heroes contain different elements, right? It's just, right. It's just a story that we can tell to contain this insight for people. And then at the highest end, it's like, if this isn't in service of agape, um, then, then it's not ultimately leading us towards heroic character. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, for the audience, this isn't me telling them that they need to go join a church and, and become, you know, devout Christians. I'm not, I'm, I'm a non-theist as you are, but I, I yeah. do think that this is true. And I also think that like meta meditation, which we learned early, which we talked about earlier, is actually one of the powerful pathways to, to yeah, cultivating yeah. this specifically. So that's that's this map that I created. This is what I wanted to share with you and get your feedback on. <laughs> oh, I like that. I, I like that. I like that. You you basically anticipated what I was going to say. So that's good. Uh, I was going to say that you know agape sort of bleeds between. Um, you know, it's it's a kind of sophism. First of all, what you want when you sever your self regulation, you don't want it to be encratic. You want it to be sophism, right? You you and and the way I describe that is you want to come to a place where you're tempted by the good. Right, that your salience landscape is constantly tempting you towards the good, and then uh, and then Paul presents agape as exactly the best form. Of Saint Paul uh, 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 is the best form of sophism because we're constantly being tempted towards the good of trying to create as much meaning and as many meaning makers as we possibly can. And so that's how exactly. Yeah, I think you you articulated what I was going to say quite well, actually. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that idea of sophism, the idea of being tempted to the good. And I was thinking about, um, well, you, actually, you I do, actually thought it was interestingly in line with like flow, the idea. Of yes, it is. I mean, you're talking a lot about this sensibility transcendence and sensibility transformation. But you're right. It, you have to have something that organizes it all together in that aspiration. Yeah, but what are we aspiring to? Well, we're ultimately aspiring to meaning making and the cultivation of meaning makers. That's what we're ultimate. This is how this whole thing, right? right grounds itself because there's nothing else beyond it that's grounding it yeah um so that's like that's logos the thing that yeah the way that we can articulate and give rise to order and agape which guides us towards order that is actually to the good uh, that yes. we, we have that faith that everyone we interact with has the capacity to come into an order that is better yes i think that's well said uh, and 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 if we didn't have if 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 we were not already grounded in logos and agape we couldn't do any of this anyways part of you know part of the the ancient notion of pride or hubris as a sin is a refusal to acknowledge that we are already beholding to logos and agape and we should acknowledge that and then put ourselves right into a participatory relationship with it rather than pretending uh, that we don't need logos and agape. Yeah, I think that's fundamentally important. So one one thing that um, occurs to me, I have I have uh, Jordan Peterson maps and meanings here, but he talks about the aspect of the heroic um, the heroic person, and uh, he talks about the logos, right, um, and that's represented by the mouth and the tongue, right, vision represented by the eyes um and he talks about those as uh you know if you look at a homunculus of the body this is what's most represented and the other thing is the hand right understanding the hand yeah, grasping yeah but for me that's the body too right yes very much very much yes and that's what i see is missing so often these conversations about meaning is how it gets grounded in the body Oh, but you see, that's right. That's why I emphasize the contact epistemology so much, because the contact epistemology reminds us about the embodied embeddedment as well, as opposed to the sort of, sort of spectating, spectatorial yeah. epistemology. I'm not sure if I've talked to you about this. We were talking about nature. Like, how does 
natural movement, natural parkour, change, create connection with nature. And, um, and, uh, and Peterson has this analogy of, 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 um, of resolution. Right. Imagine that you have high pixels or low pixels, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the more pixelated your thing is, and since some, the more meaning you have extracted from it. I'm thinking, like, imagine the experience of a tree, right? You have me showing you the picture of the tree, and you can say, "Oh, that's a beautiful tree," right? I, uh, I would love to see that tree. Mm -hmm. If you walk in through the park and you can see that tree. And that would be more meaningful. It would be more real. Having had that experience, participated in being near the tree, would be more real. Um, but when you move in the tree, when you map it with your body, when you map how it affords your body moving from space yeah, to space, yeah. this creates a layer of meaning that has greater depth. And you can go in another even more. It's like if you know what animals live there, you know what... Yeah. Yeah. you know how it's used you know what kind of timber it makes like all of these things are are built up into meaning and it's like um it feels like we we have become divorced from this incredible world of meaning that exists all around us that we're simply blind to yes i agree that's why i've been trying to articulate um this notion of sacredness <clears throat> as a deep kind of connectedness to the inexhaustible as opposed to older models of completion and perfection which tended to be very static and, and tended to uh give us the idea that there was sort of a, a, a um a final state that we were trying to get to and achieve but if we can i think what you're doing if you'll allow me is i think you're trying to re-articulate this notion of sacredness as this fount, right? There's this fount of just more and more intelligibility, more and more meaning, more and more connectedness. And what you're saying is, of course, not just intellectual connectedness. It's the embodied and embedded connectedness. And, and, and that's exactly it. They're like, it, can we get back to, right, that sense of uh, that our, our, our ongoing capacity to evolve our connection to the world can be coupled to the fact that the world can continually generate new connections for us it's inexhaustible in that way and to understand sacredness in that fashion that's that's precisely why i'm trying to articulate that idea i i i i, I see what you're doing is you re, you're using nature and i don't mean in some sort of you know uh, you know pantheistic paganism or something like that but you're trying to reintroduce nature as something that can be experienced as sacred as a as a as a sacred experience for people, and I think that's very important. And the, and the fact that we, it, see it, it doesn't involve people having to sort of commit to a creed. It has to. It involves them committing to a code of conduct, though, because if they don't commit to a code of conduct, they're going to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. and right. But 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 it, it involves it, it involves a different way. Um, it involves a different way of getting people to re-inhabit sacredness as opposed to just argue about the propositions that have been referring to sacredness. Does that make any sense what I'm trying what I'm trying to articulate? Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 very interesting. I mean, uh, so my old business partner Tyson, um, when we started our parkour gym together, he um he always joked that we should just turn parkour into a church, right? <laughs> um, but now, like, people will be like, well, what are you creating? You're creating a religion? Um, and I was like, well, no, not a credo. But I am trying to help people connect to religio. Well, that's that's exactly right. And that's why making that distinction, I think, is really important. Um, and, and, you know, and you're, and you're creating a very complex mytho mythos, right? Uh, we're even talking about using mythological uh, figures in order to afford people coming into a more direct participatory awareness of religio and how if they enhance that connectedness, they get this experience of it being intrinsically meaningful. But again, it, but in, 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 this, in this sense in which it's... I, I, I become sort of, as you know, I've become hesitant with the word meaning because it sounds so subjective. And I, I really want to, I, that's why I like what you've been saying, the sense of increasing connectedness. And that's what I'm trying to get it. It's the, connect, and even the word connectedness sounds static and fixed, I'm, but I'm trying to, it's more this ongoing, mutually accelerating disclosure. That's why it's more, much more like love than it is like making a statement. 
Yeah. You're helping, you're helping people to have that, right? And I don't mean this romantically, and we've trivialized the word with romanticism, but you're helping people to fall in love with sort of the depths of connect, through the depths of connectedness that they can find in the natural world. They're, they're falling back in love with being. And I think that's the ultimate way in which we have to respond to nihilism. We can argue and we can make philosophical propositions, but people have to learn how to deeply fall back in love with reality. That's what they need. And again, you know, I I, I don't mean this Erotic. romantically. I, I mean it this in, in the sense of a sacred kind of loving. Erotically. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. No, that really, that like, you know, that struck home for me, right? Mm. Like, especially because going back to the idea that agape is the principle that gives yes. highest access to the good, right? Yes, yes. It, it's, it's, it's kind of like the idea that that the proper practice is a practice that bring that that continually helps you fall in love with all of the most important things in life. Yes, yes, yes. That that seems extraordinarily powerful. It, it's interesting. One of the you know, let me just I, I want to I want to let that one sink in because so uh, after one of my seminars, one of the students said to me that it was it was like having gone. On, for a walk on the beach for years and years and years, and then getting to go surfing for the first time. Mm, mm, mm. And how the, the the beach now suddenly became so much more meaningful, right? Yeah. Right. Meaningful in a literal way. Like, yeah. I know these things about the waves, that's propositional, but not only do I know these things about the waves, I have felt what it is to be in those waves. I know yeah. this brilliance landscape of what those, um, the waves mean right like i know when when a wave behaves this way yes 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 towards me this thing yes and i know then also um what that experience is mm -hmm. right i i really i really have struggled with the uh, distinction between um, participatory and perspectival and yeah. in one of your recent lectures you were talking about your old model of wisdom which didn't include per participatory right um, that um that uh, the procedural, or, or sorry, um, propositional gives you rules. Procedural gives you roles. No and routines. 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 Right. And then, right. and then, uh, and then, perspectival gives you roles. And I was like, wait, what's 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 after that? But then it, it finally came together for me. It was like um, mothers should feed their children when they cry. Is is a proposition, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, keep going. Knowing how to warm up the milk and put it in the um, in the in the bottle, that's a procedure, right? Right, right, right. But you could understand the proposition, not know how to actually feed the baby. That's right. That's right. And then a baby crying is a salience landscape that becomes especially meaningful to any yeah. woman who has had a baby or yeah. maybe had a baby. Right. And that that is a that is an experience that is shared. Right. That perspective is true of all the all the class of mothers. Mm -hmm. But what that meant to that individual woman at that time is the participatory. Right. The way, she identify, the way she changes her identity. So she's identifying with the child. Yeah. That's that's the participatory. Right. Yeah. Well, she, she her her process of being and the child's process of being become deeply coupled and interpenetrating. So her knowing of herself and her knowing of her child are not distinguishable from each other. They mutually interpenetrate and afford each other. Yeah. So then to look at the practice, the movement practice, right? To do a jump or a vault or something, I can tell you in this situation, this is the appropriate jump or vault or swing or whatever to do. That would be propositional, right? Mm -hmm. knowing in your body having the skill to do it is procedural That's procedure right being able to recognize it within a given yes. space is perspective situational awareness that's perspectival yeah but then the way that it transforms you is the participatory and that's what you see right and that goes back to that uh, underneath and grounding this is your aspiration to your heroic future self and you knowing and becoming 
because it's a Socratic self-knowledge, that, fu that future self is bound up with you knowing and getting access to the depths of the world. That's what I mean about the depths of you and the depths of the world. Your knowing of your depths and your knowing of the depths of the world are like the mother and the child being identified with each other. They are mutually interpenetrating and mutually affording. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. So the other thing that's occurred to me with this, which is interesting, is a while ago I read this essay on Jitsu versus Tao. Have we talked about this? Uh, not, not to me, I don't think. So... The idea was simply that traditionally many martial arts started as essentially like trade skills, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, Aido or Aikijutsu was, was a trade skill for someone who had to use a sword in battle. That's mm -hmm. what it meant. It meant when procedurally, when my life is on the line, I can use this thing to try and save myself. Mm -hmm. um, however, there was a point at which, and this happened in different ways, people recognized that the process of, of going through the procedure, the jitsu, afforded a do. And a do is a way. Mm -hmm. right? do, do in Japanese is dao in Chinese. Right, right. And so aikijitsu becomes aikido, right? Mm -hmm. And you see the same thing in the internal martial arts. You know, you're a Taiji Shuan practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. you, you practice things because you know they're martial skills but that's only one layer of the practice and of course Haji Quan and Bagua and Yingji are our Taoist arts right they're deeply connected with this whole ecology of practices of specific meditations and body practices all the Qigong all yeah. the Qigong you know traditional medicines um, yeah. all of that was, was sort of part of this 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 world and and what I recognized when I read that was that parkour in its in its initial development was actually do oriented and that the do was not sufficiently articulated when it oh, I see. the world. Yeah. So all we saw was the jitsu. So right, we were right. jumping and vaulting and doing these things. But what we didn't see was that the young men who'd started this, they were immigrant you know, mixed race, kids, visible minorities, traumatic backgrounds, you know, they're having trouble, many of them are having trouble in school, they were, you know, they were, they were, they could have gotten involved in gangs, there were lots of gangs in their neighborhoods and the families of Paris, um, and they, they needed some place to go. Uh, it was a way, it was an aspirational strong, way. Strong young men, and that was the purpose of it, the purpose yeah, of it. Yeah. How do I test myself and become this thing that I, that I want to be? The, there was you know nine to twelve founders of parkour and at a certain point david bell who's the most famous split with the rest over a, a circus performance um but the rest of them then adopted a name for themselves called which is yamakazi which is a lingala word which is a west african language which means strong man strong mind strong spirit or strong spirit mm -hmm. strong body strong man something like that and the idea you can see the aspiration in it the yes, very much. This is the transformation of the self. Right, very much. And so it feels like in many ways what I have been creating with Evolve Move Play is a return to the Tao, right? Yes, I agree with that. And, um, and this came up for me because I was thinking about that idea you had of the, the sacredness as the inexhaustible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Like even when it's interesting, when I started telling people the dragon story and connecting it to the idea of the the, the pursuit of the heroic self, I always like to caveat it by saying, but always remember the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I can reveal to you about the orientation of your practice never will will be sufficient to contain all of what the practice is or can mean to you. Mm -hmm. So don't get too attached to it. Yeah. Um, and now I feel like I'm kind of tangentially running in many different directions because you you stimulated this thought around Tao and the way that you were describing that 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 um, the way in which being is sort of is both inexhaustible and and withdrawing from you and also yeah or shining in yeah yeah at the same time and that, that that relationship with being and being able to to come more and more into that relationship with being 
uh, is maybe the orientation of the practice. And that's why the, the idea of, of, of movement practice as Tao uh, came through for me as something that I needed to share with you. I think that's excellent. I mean, it might be then that, um, that there's a higher order connection uh, going on here because I think what you just articulated was excellent. Um, but it's, uh, as you know, I brought that language up to try and talk a bit about Heidegger and also the kind of stuff that's happening in the circling practice, which is this interpersonal dialogue, dialogical practice. And yet there seems to be this higher order point of convergence. I'm not trying to do, I'm not trying to collapse everything. I'm trying to do like a small world network. There's this higher point of convergence that they can all talk to each other out. And then they, right, you get the compression, you get the compression to what is shared. And then you get the variation out into the specific practices. John, I'm going to have to take a quick break. My daughter. Just, okay. I'll be right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so we'll pause this for a second. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, guys, we have an extra guest today. Special guest. This is Katie. Um, so, uh, hopefully she will let us have a little chat. Will you let us have a little chat, Katie? Katie? Uh, Andrea, she's going to sit with me. Okay. <laughs> My other daughter. Okay. Thank you for, for your patience. Um, <laughs> I've had kids too. I, do, I, mean, I still have kids, but I mean, I've had, I've had young kids, so I know it, I know it. I really enjoy it. It's like living with, and I mean, this is a compliment. It's like living with elves. I mean, it's just an amazing, they're amazing. Um, look, great. Before we're running out of time, and so uh, I'm not trying to uh, shut things out. I just need to say something about this, like, and and this is really, I'm, I'm just I'm being very sincere. I'm really impressed um, by the work you've done, and I'm not trying to in any way take credit for your ideas or your insights. But I see also in a lot of ways, if, if this, I, I hope this feels fair to you, in which you're making use of a lot of my ideas and what you're doing, what you're doing with it. It is, it's just impressive. It's really impressive. It's, it's, it's like, if, if you'll allow me an analogy, I, I might be doing this science, but you're doing this amazing engineering that is, is just like, like it's exemplary. It's exemplary. I, I want people to see what you're doing and understand what you're doing as a clear example of the kind of stuff I'm talking about, how it's been concretized and developed, but, and it, how it's evolving. I just wanted to say that because it's, it's very, very, very impressive work. Well, thank you. I, um, that means a lot to hear that. You, your work has been really deeply influential. It's been, you know, um, uh, Jordan Peterson gave me a window into the meaning thing in a way that, you know, is still, he, he had a huge influence in grammar. And then running into your work has given me uh, this, this wonderful set of tools. I, I was telling you before that I, I sat down and started like writing out some of your key insights. <laughs> I, could, I could organize where I'm using them and how that's how those 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 threads in my experience with parkour, play research, you know, um, you know, flow. There's so much, there's so many in there, but like, you know, you hold a very high place in 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 the the set of influences that are giving me the insights to create what we're creating and and also the the example that you've given in your friendship has been uh, extraordinarily meaningful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's it, that's that's deeply reciprocated. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say that because, um, like I say, one of the one of the legitimate criticisms. I'm not trying to dodge it that people make in my work is that it's often very abstract, mm -hmm. um, right? And it's like, yes, but what do I do? Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I try to address that as best I can. But um, you're doing a much better job at addressing that. Than, uh, than I have done or potentially ever could do. So I wanted to thank you for that as well. Well, that is quite the high praise. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's fine. You please, please do. Uh, please do. I, um, I I wanted to, I mean, it may, may be time to close the conversation here, but I, I wanted to address, like the last time we spoke, you were, uh, you were asking me to, to pay attention to your dialogues with, um, with, with Guy Seng's talk. Yes, very much. I, th I thought this was interesting and I wanted to, to share my experience with you and hopefully this will be interesting to the audience as well. Um, it was initially hard for me to listen to uh, Guy because I find that what is attractive to me a lot of the times is that facility with juggling propositions or having yeah. a clear set of propositions that you're offering. Mm -hmm. And when I 
who's listening to him talk to you, he's not offering so much of his position, uh, so much of his propositions. That's right. That's fair. What 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 comes through is actually the example of participating in what he's trying to create. Yes, very and much. It's a very similar much. thing. And it, I actually listened to my, uh, you know, it was nice to listen to my friend Mark Walsh's interview with Guy because then you got a little bit more of an idea behind That's it. That's right. That's right. And I also just happened to have another fr- a few friends who've also gotten into circling. And so it's it's been very interesting to take on some of the ideas and bring that into um, to my relationship with my wife, um, but also oh. you know, thinking about how we use dialoguing as an mm-hmm. integration practice, because I think it's it's incredibly valuable, and I think if we are if we're if we're letting uh, you know we we had this conversation before we started the call about kind of the grammar of sport and physical culture and why it might have been lo- have lost the meaning that it should yeah. have or how it might have had meanings embedded in it that we don't really want to keep embedding in it. That's right. And maybe we can get into that in a future one after I do some more research. But um, but if we're if we're choosing a new orientation towards meaning, and it is towards this idea of the, the cultivation of the self, you connecting it to the practice of mindfulness, connecting it to the practice of dialoguing becomes incredibly powerful. So I'm I'm very interested in the work you're doing with Guy and with, and with Jordan Hall, and I recommend all the, the the listeners look into that. And it's something that um, yeah, I want to know more about and how we can yeah. facilitate I, yeah. this growth of the dialogos in relation, you know, like, and this, this is kind of what I want to offer that conversation too. It's like, I think that if we can get the the embodiment and we can get mm-hmm. the embedding mm-hmm. into the environment and we can connect that to the dialoguing process. So we're getting that zooming in, getting this mm-hmm. broader perspective. We're having the embodied experience. Like, you know, I was really gutted that you didn't make it to, um, to the autumn retreat because I want I want the yeah. I want conversation I, comes out of that shared experience. Yeah, no, I do, and, and I, 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 well, you know, I, I'm showing that I'm deeply committed to participant observation, yeah. so I very much want to do that. Yeah, I, I thank you for saying that. I recommend the, especially the two videos with the four of us, mm-hmm. with Guy, uh, Sen Stock, Jordan Hall, myself, and Christopher Master Pietro, because I think those two videos, especially with the with the four of us, you because we all. It, we, it's much more like what we're talking about. The, 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 you get a mini, you get the, the four kinds of knowing. I'm not saying that each one of us represents one of the kinds of knowing or anything ridiculous like that, but all the kinds of knowing are put into much more dynamic interaction um, in a powerful way, which I, I really, I, I like I said, it, there's, a, there's a thing there, the logos comes um, um, and, and it takes everybody in a, into a place where they can't get to on its own. And, and, and knowing how to translate, maybe that's the right verb, between that interpersonal and then the way we talked about how you, how you get people into that kind of dialogic emergence of the logos with respect to nature and the environment. And getting those two dialogues to dialogue uh, together, I think, is something that I'm deeply interested in understanding uh, more deeply. Yeah. And the communication that comes through the body, right? I yes. You know, we're very interested in is how... Like we've become divorced from a meaning again. Like if you if if I say something to you here and you can see me and you can hear my tone of voice, there's layers of meaning that are divorced. That if I said the same thing to you in a text message. Oh, of course. And and so one of the things you're picking up on the circling practice is because you're always having the stereoscopic vision. You're doing this deep mindful awareness inward, and then you're doing a deep mindful awareness outward. But what one of the things you'll often pick up on. Um, is you'll pick up on the mediating role of gesture between the propositional and, mm. and the perspectival and the way. And so very often people will, uh, you'll even see it in some of the times when I'm talking with Guy, he'll say, well, you just, you sort of, you sort of stood back, you sort of moved back and you sort of mm, tilted your head, like he'll call out gesture. And, you know, and, and, and that's, uh, that for me is something I want to understand too. Um, the, 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 that, Reappropriation or reexaptation of gesture as a way of bridging between the propositional aspects of dialogue and the more procedural and the the more embodied aspects of the dialogue. And and so within what we call roughhousing, right, we have the layer of communication that comes where we actually are touching each other and we learn to have sensitivity and contact there. And, And this, I think, 
gives a sensitivity and an awareness. You know, the research, like um, I was, I'm just writing about this right now, but um, you know, research shows that rough and tumble play increases capacity for empathy. It essentially, of course, your ability for theory of mind. And oh so yeah, because you're training the insula to pick up on your own interoceptive stuff, it, 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 coupled to your uh, trying to get a sense of where the other person is expressing their intentionality through how they're moving. Yeah, that that makes that makes very good sense to me. And so it'll be very interesting to think about how can we get that connection from the, the from let's embed ourselves in the environment, let's create our container, let's move with each other, let's move, and then. Let's create dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. And how does that that generate the meaning? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that we're just about out of time here, uh, but I deeply appreciate the conversation. Well, I, I, I thoroughly I thoroughly enjoyed it, Rave. I mean, it was good for me. I got to spend a lot of time, and I I, I mean this in a good sense. I got I got to spend a lot of time listening because I, I got really deeply interested mm -hmm. in, like I said, what you're doing, and that's why it provoked that reaction and you know, that response in me. Uh, to what you're doing, uh, so I, I, I thank you. Uh, it's like I just want to—I don't know—it it seems so trite, but I just want to keep encouraging you to do what you're doing. It's meaningful. It really helps to have people who, who you know, uh, who believe in what, we, what you're doing and who you know can can afford it. Single amplify. Yeah, appreciate it every time you do that. So I think my children are 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 going to call a a, a call. Up an end to this call um and <laughs> yeah you need to move on with your day but uh we'll we'll chat again soon I, I deep uh, uh, of, it's been oh, of, of course my friend we'll talk again for sure you can count on it okay take care my friend mm -hmm.